Okay, scenario. Your dispatch, 24-year-old woman complaining of chest pain, shortness of breath. CAD uh, indicates possible drug-seeking patient. Uh, patient obvious distress. Onset is half an hour ago. Sharp pain. Back of the chest. Less severe episodes in the past. No, no known history of cardiac disease. No primary care. Denies recreational drug history of lupus. So what do you guys think so far? What do you want to know? What should you be looking for? Do you want to know lung sounds? Mental status, okay. What else would you want to know? Heart rate, vitals. Okay. What she was doing when the chest pain started. Okay. How are you gonna what makes you what ways could you look to rule out that this is a drug seeking episode versus an actual medical emergency? There's a, there's a there's a pop question for you. Like what? Like, is she constantly saying, "Hey, can I get some pain medicine? Hey, can I get some well, pain medicine?" Well, if you're in a lot of pain, 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 pain wouldn't you do that too? What 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 questions are you gonna ask? You have pain radiating your left shoulder. Do you feel nauseous, vomiting? You don't want to give her pain radiating the left shoulder because that's going to be a leading question for her. So how are you gonna get around that? Where is the pain? I mean, just can you read where pain is going? Does it radiate? Is it central? Is it one or two? Okay. Describe the description of the pain. Okay. Sharp pain. Okay. Is her being a drug seeker really an issue here? I think you should just go into that not thinking. Go down the road. I mean, I know it's hard to do, but I mean, don't think of it as okay. She's doing going back into the patient because she. What if you're wrong? Maybe you get tunnel vision. Because if she dies, because. What if it's just she's withdrawing? But if you go in a tunnel vision, she's a drug seeker. She's a drug, you know, you're going to miss the force of the tree. Yeah, she's maybe she's withdrawing from all of her pain meds. Maybe that's why she's feeling that way. So, it's, I mean, we're, not, we're, kind of, we're kind of delving into but an ethical. Sometimes can't detoxing be um, dangerous, though. Yeah. So, are we going to give her pain meds? Well, the lupus causes the joint pain and stiffness and things like that. And they'll give them steroids, but they could also be on the pain medication for the lupus. What else does lupus do? Since you guys are looking, looking it up. This, the butterfly rash across mm -hmm. her face. What about um, chest pain and pleuritic pain? Shortness of breath, chest pain. Tough one, huh? Headaches. Bad much so. I'd be yeah, air in the side. Yeah, this is one of those. You air in the side of caution. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just do a workup. Put them on monitor. See what's going on. Yeah, you're done. You're done. Yeah, you can always but, justify well, she was complaining of chest pain and blah blah. Well, the, yeah. I can't prove that she was. And yeah, I mean, it, justify giving it. Really I mean, you can't prove it's, they're a drug seeker. It's not I mean, a business. Yeah, you really can't. You you, re you really really can't unless there's something in there in the whole interview that I mean, there are several things that do not add up, and say, wait a minute, this story is completely inconsistent every time we ask. No, 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 no. Now we can kind of figure it out. But I mean, if we sit there and say, hey, look, it looks like a duck is quacking like a duck, and we're going to call it lupus. This is why you're having. Then we're going to treat it as such. That, that it's they're tough. They're tough to deal with. I mean, you don't want to deny treatment, but like I said, just again. The assessment thing is like, well, how are you going to, you know, if you're dealing with that, that drug seeking issue, how are you going to deal with that? Well, you could give them the, the lowest narcotic level or lowest pain medicine you have. You don't is have that, to is the that, is that, appro you is that appropriate treatment? Is that appropriate treatment, though? But then you're talking about like malfeasance and. It's a fun game, isn't it? No. Yeah, it's 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 a. Th this is where, like I said, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Make sure everything fits, everything works together. You know, I can tell you this much. Usually, when it comes to drug seekers, I mean, one, they're going to be really one. If they already have a condition, you don't know. You're not going to know, and they might be drug seeking because I mean, I mean, some of these guys actually, you know, if they're really uh, on uh, high doses of opiates, I mean, some of these people in, on uh, for pain management can be up to a good 1,200 milligrams a day, easily. And they're used to that. 
So, but the thing is, like I said, if they got a, a condition, yeah. I mean, you, you can't get around that. But, like I said, it's just kind of like looking at what doesn't make sense. If everything makes sense, treat it. If it doesn't make sense, then let's deal with that issue. Like I had one guy, he had like a history of back pain, calls us up, this, that, and the other. He wanted us to give him morphine and leave. We can't, you know, of course we got this big old discussion. We can't do that. It's like, we already talked to one of your commanders, this, that, and the other, and da, 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 da. No, we're not going to do that. If you want to go to the hospital, yes, but I can't do that and just leave you here. He wouldn't go to the hospital and let me treat him, you know, give him morphine, but he definitely wanted me to give him morphine and just leave. Now I've got something a little bit more substantial at that point. So just, you know, you got to look for those, you know, inconsistencies or awkward, you know, situations. You're like, wait a minute here, something, all right? Can you call medical control and medical direction and ask him if you can give it to him to leave? No, I called my commander and said, yeah. He kept throwing his commander's name, and I'm like, yeah. I, well, first he kept saying, you know, I, I talked to commander right then. It's like, I don't think Mike can do that. You know, so it's like, let's get back on the same page here. And I was like, well, he, he's all sitting there, you know, banging his fist and everything. I'll tell you what, I'll call my commander, and let's see what he has to say. Because he's about to make a complaint and all this other business. My commander comes down, and he's like, no, you can't do that. If you want to go, we can do it, but we cannot just give you morphine and leave. You know, so you get more... Well, let's stop him being like, you give him the morphine. Okay, I want to, you know, I want to sign refusal, pull over to the side of the road and let me go. Good question. You have to let him know. Uh, yeah. He's in his kidnapping. They're calling Yeah. Or I could sit there and say, prove he was making an appropriate decision because of all the narcotics I gave him. <laughs> prove it now. So anyway, what key, uh, key pieces of data we have we talked about, we asked what would you want to know more. How would you determine uh, if this is a life threat or something else? Well, your life threats are going to be your shock symptoms, your okay. blood pressure, your cool, clammy skin, breath rate, Belly, breathing, breathing rate, patterns, circulation, fusion. perfusion, cyanosis, all those things. So, and we talked about whether we give this patient medication. If you have a protocol system, which protocol does this patient require? You guys in the field, where does this person fall in? Pain management. Yeah, pain management at that point. Okay, decision making is an expectation of all healthcare providers. You know, and the thing is, the nice part about decisions is you got to make one and you got to go with it. Uh, understand, you guys ever watch, um, was it Emergency? I watched one episode and that was enough, by the way. But um, yeah, if you ever see that, you know, there was no leeway at all. They couldn't do anything. But yeah, the, ideally it was just very much a very technician based program. And that's actually kind of one of the things that actually shot ourselves in the foot in trying to develop because nurses were always able to keep us at bay by saying they're just more concerned about their skills, more concerned about their skills. Let's just keep them where they are, don't bring them in the hospital. So made very few decisions uh, and only good at psychomotor skills. Anybody see my stapler? <laughs> Today's paramedics, again, obviously we have to be professionals, broadly written standards of care. You know, again, it's kind of like, okay, we're going to give you the guidelines. We're going to give you the ability to make decisions with it. And, you know, you don't need to call us all the time for it. So analyze information, make diagnoses, form a treatment plans without uh, direct physician contact. So make critical decisions, obviously, and need. Obviously, we have the need for critical thinking and decision-making skills. So our expected role, obviously, we need to assess the situation. We need to sit there and analyze all the information, form an initial diagnosis, develop appropriate treatment plans, and then we have to implement them. So the problem is, is that we are obviously under pressure at that point, and typically without online medical control. You'll see in a lot of interviews and a lot of testing, you know, a lot of, I've seen people say, well, I'm going to call medical control. You know, well, you're out of range. I'm going to call the helicopter. It's a sunny day. They're on a PR. A lot of this that we're geared for is, yes, medical control is there. Yes, it's good to have, but you need to be independent. If you're too dependent on them, you're not doing your job. You have to have so much independence built in and functional, functional independence. And then it's like, okay, wait a minute. I've already gone through my whole list of things, things like this. I'm coming to the end. Now let's call them. 
that's that's the big difference. But understand, you're an independent provider. Uh, influencing factors, pre-hospital versus hospital, environment and setting. Obviously, one's nice, warm, climate controlled. The other one isn't. One's relatively safe. The other one isn't. Diagnostic data, we don't have much compared to a hospital. We can't do MRIs. We can't do, uh, can't draw labs. Well, we can draw labs, but we're not going to get anything. You know, we can't do x-rays yet, supposedly. So patient acuity. What do you think is the difference between hospital and pre-hospital in that one? What's patient acuity, by the way? Patient acuity is how sick they are. The higher acuity, the more sick they are. Low acuity patient. They have, they have the history. Hmm? Like in a hospital, they have the history of the patient. We do We have to ask all these kind of questions and kind of figure out what's going on with the patient. Well, the, um, well just think of the sick patients. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, think about dealing with a sick patient in a hospital versus th dealing with a really sick patient in the field. You've got, I mean, compared to a hospital, you have numerous, numerous resources. You have beds. You have a lot of doctors on call. You can get, you know, if they have any problems, they can call other doctors to come help them out. They've got nurses, respiratory therapists, yada, yada, yada. Spe yeah, specialists. What do we have? About five, six people, you know? First responders. Yeah. You know, I mean, they've got so many, you know, tools and references, and we don't. So when it comes to dealing with, you know, high-acuity patients, we're very limited and not a whole lot to, uh, on our side. Uh, scope of practice? There's doctors and surgeons at hospital. They don't have very, very broad there. Yeah, they've got, their, they've got their own deal going on. You know, and obviously the thing is, even with the nurses, I mean, at least, you know, they're under direct supervision of a physician. You know, again, like I said, all those people and all those resources are there. You know, what do we, you know, like I said, you were pretty much going to say, you know, here's your protocol, go make, you know, make, a, make the best, uh, go make good decisions and have at it. So interpersonal relationships. What are the interpersonal relationships at a hospital? Well, like nurses working with doctors and yep. they're all, we're not all buddy-buddy, but they work well, together just on a more regular basis. Nurses working with doctors, what else, what other relationships? In a hospital, like re respiratory therapists, they're dealing with those people on a regular basis, right? Who else is in the hospital? Social, same social workers, same. Yeah, they'll you know relatively the same. You know they're dealing with the, those people. Look at all the different interpersonal relationships that we have out there: firefighters, cops. You know. Um, you start going to the homeless shelters, you're going to have all, you know, people that work there. You know, any kind of, I mean, really, ours is just everything, almost everything outside health healthcare related. They, they've got all those healthcare related relationships with each other, can all work together. Ours are more operational kind of issues. So our, you know, relationships are going to, di are, are going to be vast. And, oh, and actually, I take that back. I mean, we do have a relationship with the docs and nurses in the ERs. I mean, ours are just... Humongous. I mean, we can throw anybody into the mix, and they may not be much of a relationship because I mean, some people we may see only once or twice in a you know a couple of years, and some people we may see on a regular basis. So, so acuity, um, severity of patient condition. Generally, it's we're critical, potentially life-threatening, and non-life-threatening. What do you think is most difficult? Critical. I think potential. Or potential life-threatening. Yeah, because we they're just sitting on that teeter totter. It's like, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? You know, if you're critical, I already know where you're going. If you're not in life threatening, I already know where you're going. If you're critical, I'm sitting there waiting. I'm waiting. I'm watching. Uh, Pre-compiled responses, obviously, protocols. I mean, obviously, if you have chest pain, we're going to go, you know, oxygen, morphine, or fentanyl, aspirin nitroglycerin, and so forth. And if obviously we start having any kind of dysrhythmias, we can look at amino road and lidocaine. Algorithms, when you guys get into ACLS, you'll definitely learn about algorithms. You know, that's, where, that's kind of where we start, you know, actually like CBA, they start talking about with the CPR. Now we're going to add in 
you know, obviously if you go to, you know, ventricular pulseless uh, V-fib, okay, we're going to, you know, defib rate at 360 or 200 biphasic. At that point, we're going to continue compressions two minutes. Check for pulse. If not, okay, bring the defib rate again. If not, we're going to go give 300 milligrams of amiodarone. It just becomes a decision tree at that point. If that changes, boom, next algorithm, you switch to different rhythm, we're going to go to that, that algorithm. That's, by the way, when it comes to a good portion of cardiology is just knowing those, alg by the way, down the road, know those algorithms backwards and forwards. That will make your life a lot easier. Um, and even going further with that, if you'll notice, a lot of what we do is very out is on algorithms. Situation changes, we go down a different route. We kind of go down the following steps. Previous experiences, I saw this work. This seems to be working. I'm going to kind of keep doing this. Uh, personal biases, you know, like some, one of my personal biases, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with an ET tube, working with an ET tube, and it's like, you know, I don't, I'm glad to have things like Kings and stuff out there, but I'm still kind of that older mentality of, we really probably could just be just fine with an ET tube if we actually just reinforced better training and practice. So I've got, a, I've got a couple, actually I've got a few of those and I know they, I know they're just, again, biases. Critical thinking and reasoning, that is different between good and great. Okay. It's, you, it's, this is, you're going to realize this is more of a thinking game than it is a hands-on game. The hands-on part is actually pretty, it's only about 20% of what you're going to be doing. You know, and that's even adding all the skills with it. It's the actual thinking, what's coming up next? What am I dealing with? What directions could this go? How am I going to prepare for these directions? So anyway, our decision making and critical thinking is knowing the fundamental of anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology. If we know how it works, that's great. Pathophysiology, if we break it somewhere, we're going to see some kind of cascade effect, right? Nothing, everything's always kind of working. You notice that the body always seems to kind of be always working in a very, you know, circular motion. One's always affecting another, affecting another. If we put a monkey wrench somewhere, we start seeing a big ripple effect and change and so forth. And so what does pharmacology do? intervenes at those points of pathophysiology, and then we start, hopefully, go back to a normal stasis. So yeah, knowing pathophysiology, knowing pharmacology is a really, really, really good thing. And it's not just knowing, like, the, just pathophysiology of what you're going to learn um, next section. It's just knowing disease pathophysiology. You know, like we were talking about, like, you know, uh, emphysema, knowing that p disease pathophysiology. What am I up against? What drugs do I have that can now give me the desired effect that I want? If this is getting worse, how far do I get need to get ready to go? With me on that? So organizing information or focusing on large amounts of data. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to spit out a whole bunch of things at you. Here's this, 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 this. Go, see you, bye. You know, especially with the multi-systems trauma. Here, the, you're, I mean, it's, I mean, literally. 35-year-old male, MVC, you know, um, motorcycle accident, no helmet, was alert and oriented, went to a seizure. We got him on a backboard. We didn't be able to check anything else. Here you go. Bye. Okay. Take that and run. Uh, identifying and dealing with am, uh, ambigu ambiguities. What do you think those could be? Give me some gray areas to deal with. When or when not to backboard a patient? Or when yeah. Or when yeah, just because you're playing a back pain, do we really need to throw them on a backboard? You know, where, where's that line that says put them on a board? Where I mean, we try to. We try to, but it's always not that, always that clear. You know, I mean, that, do, we, do we really need to be clearing people for C-spine in the field? Do we not? And at what point do we sit there and say, okay, the C-spine is tender, put them on a board, or do we say those muscles that are just um, adjacent to the C-spine are tender, then we put them on a board, or do we say no at that point? Or do we say, wait a minute, this was low mechanism, and you've got some paraspinal pain, do I need to put you on a board? How do I know it's not a C-spine injury? Those are always fun, fun ones to play with. Determining relevance. You know, I've got chest pain, uh, shortness of breath, 
It's a 10 out of 10, but I've noticed my, I'm having some numbness tingling in my right foot. Not too concerned. They can, we can scratch that out, put that somewhere else. Okay. Analyzing and comparing uh, similar situations. This, can act, this obviously falls back to experience. And because, like I said, I mean, you'll notice between different paramedics, experience is going to dictate how they act. And I mean, I can think of, you know, when I first started as a paramedic, I mean, you got hit by a car, I'm throwing you on a board. And then I remember once guy actually got hit by a very, like, less than 10 miles per hour, you know, um, on the street. Partner comes in, assesses it. Okay, you're fine. You get up. And I was like, what? You know, why are you doing that? And he was just like, you know, I've, I've worked so many football games. These guys get help hit a lot harder than that and as much as I've assessed you know I look for this 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 you know I'm okay with this explaining decisions and constructing logical arguments get ready for that especially when we start doing scenarios because one thing we like to do at the end of scenarios we want to sit there and say okay well tell me what happened it's basically kind of like giving a report to a physician okay tell me what happened what you got from beginning to end who is this person how old are they da 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 they say well you know and use it to think well I'm thinking they're having an MI Next twist is, okay, tell me about how an, what happens with an MI. How does that all work? Or, you know, how does it create the problem? You know, and that's, that's going to be a lot of the same things. If you sit there and say, hey, look, you know, I had to sit there and call this an MI. You know, you got to be able to, sometimes you might have to explain it to the doc and say, okay, look, because it was this, 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 and I saw this, this, and this, and everything seemed to match up. I went down the MI row. I didn't see anything else even though you might end up finding out it was a PE or something like that. So, make sense? Okay. The differentials, what is this about? So, facilitating behavior, stay calm, plan for the worst. Always plan for the worst. Always plan for the worst. Work systematically, work very systematically. Okay, and remain adaptable. Like I said, the systematic part you want that to be just something that's second nature to you. You don't have to worry about it, having to adjust it or anything. Um, planning for the worst, just remember it can always get worse and it can get worse for you even when you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing. That's just life. That's people. And remain adaptable because adaptable, things can change. I mean, like I said, if you have two, uh, two uh, comorbidities functioning at the same time, you may be taking care of one, then the other one decides you know, cause problems with you too, and now you're dealing with two different issues. So what's the difference between reflective versus impulsive thinking? It would be reflective. Maybe like you look at the situation, think about it for a bit. You know. Okay. Think about what you do and then it's going to, what the outcome of your actions are going to be. Okay, what's impulsive? You decide you're going to do something, you just do it. You just go. What are the advantages and disadvantages of those two? It's a little bit slower, yeah. Mm -hmm. Slower, but you kind of minimize the risk more. Impulsive is fast, but more risk. Well, it's impulsive. What's the advantage to impulsive? If it works. If you're right, you're better chance to save the patient. Yeah, it may be something. Oh, wait a minute. Here, let me put this tube down your nose. Boom, got you. We're taken care of. Didn't even think about it. Do I need to put CPAP? Do you need to do this? No. We're going this, this direction. Uh, divergent versus convergent. What's the difference between the two words? Yeah, when we branch out, when we, a lot of our assessments are actually more convergent. And when it's when we don't know, we actually flip to a more divergent way of assessing questions. It's like, okay, wait a minute, I gotta start at this headache thing. Now I gotta figure out where this is going to go. Or a lot of times it's like, you know, chest pain thing. It's like, okay, we're having this pain here. Okay, now I can converge on that point because I'm gonna ask all these questions that's gonna isolate to this. What's the advantages and disadvantages of that, of both? Divergent can get you way off where you actually need to be. Mm -hmm. Divergent could be more like tunnel vision on one. So let's see, advantages of divergent. Advantages of divergent. You can cover a wider array of possibilities with them, or not with the range of possibilities, but with the range of possibilities. What about convergent? Quickly narrow down what you're trying to do. Anticipatory versus reactive. More preparation. Okay. 
So react reactive is just it happens and you have to go quick and yeah. So what's a give me advantages and disadvantages between the two? Just before you're gonna be prepared for what's gonna happen even if it doesn't. Reactive and just to me that was kinda of like sit back and wait for something to happen and then react. Don't Sometimes you have to be kind of both. You know, especially when you get patients that are really, you know, bradycardic or they start throwing a bunch of what they you know, call PV. You guess who did PVCs? Yeah, because you know, those PVCs can go what they call runs of VTAC and eventually go into VTAC. That's where you got to be. And you know, you got to actually use a little bit of both. It's like uh, you know, then we started that amb uh, being ambiguous on top of it. That's a real tough teeter totter. It's like, how do I? Is this a problem? Or is this not a problem? Is this going to be a problem? Okay, effects of the nervous system, fight or flight, what happens to the body? I think I've talked to this quite a few times. What happens? Heart rate goes up. Heart rate goes up. What else? Uh, your eyes dilate. Why does your eyes dilate, by the way? Getting more light so you can see better. Okay, what else happens? Respiration goes up. Heart rate goes up. Okay, what else? Blood pressure goes up. Okay. Muscles tense. Okay. Do they tense? Or are they loosen up? They get more excitable, technically. They're more more easier to. Your nervous system is like more on edge. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you're, it's not actually a tense. It's actually they're more quick quick to discharge. So, uh, what else actually happens? Digestion slows down. And What's floating around your blood? There's a couple things floating in your blood. Adrenaline. Uh, epinephrine. And epinephrine and? Norepi. Norepi. Yeah. And what else? This is the one that gets us in the long run. Adrenaline. Cortisol. Stress thing. Yeah, it suppresses your immune system. That's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the bad sides of, the, of doing this line of work is that it's the stress, <laughs> the cortisol, Builds up in your blood, and that's like I said, it's a steroid. So if you have all this adrenaline, this epi, norepi, uh, maybe throwing a little dopamine, we can throw in a little bit of that too. How, does, how do you think this affects your ability to make uh, critic, uh, critical decisions? Impaired. Hmm. Impaired. Why? Hard Why? Well, you can't think straight. You're so. You're ready. To, you're going. You're thinking one direction or the other, right? Mm -hmm. You're again. We're we're going off instinct at that point. That that's the downside. So, so thinking under pressure, uh, scan the situation. It's the kind of thing of scanning the situation is you're almost trying to slightly remove yourself because if you're focused on this is bad, this is going to be bad. Okay, if I and I, I do this a lot. I would do this a lot. I'd start looking around because then my attention starts focusing on something. It's like that isn't bad. That isn't bad. Okay, now I can come back to this. But again, that's something we got to kind of have to develop because it's easy to get sucked in and get, you know, nervous. I mean, how about a test? Test is a perfect one. You know, you got you got you get a good catecholamine dump out of that. That's why I was telling you guys start looking around. Get something around that won't cause. That reaction that says, "Okay, that's a clock. A clock is okay," you know. <laughs> yeah, a clock is a clock is okay. Yeah. Well, then I know the clock stopped, and that's okay. The clock's not threatened. I don't have to worry about the clock. The clock is there. There's a light switch. There's a cup. You see, I'm taking a lot of the stuff that was causing that reaction. Now I'm focusing my attention there. Now I can come back to here. Now I'm kind of calm down. So, and the same thing with that. Like I said, if you're too jacked up, I mean, you're going to focus on maybe on things you don't need to. And that's why I'm like, wait a minute, let's look at other things. Stop, then consider all options. Again, the, the key thing is stop. Big thing here, a deep breath can really do a wonder for you. And at the most, it's three seconds. You know, and even if you do not want to look at anything and you just want to focus on breathing and just kind of withdraw, understand that it's only three seconds and nobody's going to really know the difference. And that can actually bring you back down. Uh, consider all consequences. Again, like I said, this is where we kind of start. Like I said, we learn 
uh, we're going to teach you a bunch of stuff. We're going to talk to you about you know how this works, how that works, and if you do this wrong, this is the consequence. You do that wrong, this is the consequence. Or this drug gives you this side effect. This drug could give you that side effect. How are you going to weigh everything in between here? Then the fun part is you know decide, act. You know sometimes it's not finding the perfect plan or this is be ideal. It's like you know this is the you know lesser of all evils. You know, this is the best I can do in this situation, and it could very well get worse. So maintain control. Remember, you're supposed to be in charge. So you set the tone. If you start flipping out, everybody else is going to think, oh, my God, this is really bad, especially people that don't have a lot of experience. They think you're, you know, they're already getting ready. To, they could be already be ready to flipping out on their own. But if they see you flipping out, they're going to flip out. And the thing is, it's in, with more experienced people, when you start seeing people really get excited and start ready to flip out on you, you're like, if this person is not in control, how much are they in control of this situation now? That's, that's one of the little, little uh, preceptor things when you get in there. Because you know, we know you're going to be a little on edge, you're going to be nervous, you're going to do this, but if we don't see you being under control, how do I, are you really going to take care of this situation appropriately? We need to know that you're aware of, hey, I know I'm getting overwhelmed, I need to back down. Kind of thing that makes you guys with me on that. That you know, I'll, I pulled a lot of people back out because of stuff like that. I remember the one guy I was trying to do an IV like this kind of a thing. It's like stop. <laughs> I'm watching him and I'm already seeing him getting wound up before he even actually goes. And I'm thinking, is he going to catch himself and say, wait a minute, stop, slow down a minute? So, and again, reevaluate. You know, and that's something that also kind of helps you calm down because, like I said, it kind of gets you into circular thinking. I'm going from eight, you know, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, okay, did this work, this work, okay, this work. Will this work, this work, and this work. You know, it gives your mind something to focus on instead of just being wired up. A critical decision process, good things to remember. Form a concept. What's, how can we form a concept on, on a shortness of breath call? Give me some concepts here. Okay. Give me some possible causes. Okay. Asthma. Okay. Foreign body. Foreign body. What else? Smoking. I mean. Yeah. Smoke, smoke inhalation. So. So it could be a lot of things. So what do we need to do? To so what do we need to do at that point? Start narrowing down. Give me information. What you know. So let's start asking questions. Hurt when you breathe? Does it hurt when you breathe in, breathe out? Are you coughing up anything? How long has this been going on? Does this wake you up out of sleep? What do you sound like? Yeah, what do you sound like? Can so, you, can you sleep sitting up or spine? Yeah. So, interpret the data. Now that we got everything, you know, we've asked all those questions. Okay, it's like, well, what is this? Does it fit somewhere? Does it not fit somewhere? Does it fit a couple places? Uh, apply known principles. You know, it's like, okay, well, obviously it sounds like it's a constriction. You know, obviously we need to open you up, so we'll give you some albuterol because that will dilate your, your bronchioles. That should allow more air in, and that should help the situation, right? Evaluate it. We give them the albuterol. Did this work? Okay. Let's go back and check, make sure it's still working. You know, nothing was, you know, we didn't have anything rebound or reflexive on us. And like I said, we just keep going and just check and check and check. Have you noticed, have you guys ever actually been a patient in the ER at all? Yeah, a lot. How many times they come and check on you? Give you something. How many times they come back and check on you? You know, like three or like at least three times. Mm -hmm. You doing okay? Everything working? Okay, okay. You're doing good. Let's get you out of here. But like I said, I want to make sure that this treatment worked and it's stabilizing. It's holding its ground. Uh, the six R's. Kind of nice little thing to help. Kind of help you remember. Read the scene. Obviously coming in again when you're walking in. What what's going on around me? What kind of situation am I in? Read the patient. You know, obviously, like actually, I think I was just thinking about the uh, the bringing out the dead, where the guy's sitting on the the gate on the fence there. Read the scene. What do you do? You walk in, you see blood coming out, lady. It's like, what does that tell you right there? There's blood on the ground, and lady there. What does that tell you guys? Something bad. Something bad, something bad really just happened. Okay, we see fish flopping on the floor. What does that scene tell you? Violence, something, yeah. Some, if we started throwing things up around, we see a guy that's you know two floors down, sprawled over. So what does that tell you about the patient? 
Huh? <laughs> He's not going to make the dive team, right? <laughs> he was trying to run out of stuff. Like, yeah. yeah. He was in a building running from somebody. Or he got pushed or yeah, thrown yeah. over. He's not. He, he was not something ext extraneous that got him to that point, and that's not good. So whatever it was obviously took a good amount of energy slash force to create this situation. So what else could be wrong with him? So, you know, react appropriately. Don't obviously jump down two floors to get to him, right? Careful, you're going to see those people, they'll do that. Actually, kind of t actually I'll tell you a little side story about reading the scene and patient and all this business. So it's uh, my first year at Austin, and I was working with this guy. He was one of the special operations guys. And those guys kind of sometimes have an, uh, a reputation of being a little too cavalier. So anyway, we're doing this drill with AFD, and we're just kind of sitting there, and I'm kind of watching them doing their fire thing and this, that, and the other. And, uh, and it's just kind of like they come dragging out, dragging out the dummy patient and everything. And I'm like, okay, let's go take him back to the truck. Where it's like, this guy said, no, no, we're going to work him right here. We're going to work our mock patient. I'm like, I wouldn't do that. No, no, this is how we're supposed to do this. And I'm like, I wouldn't do that. Okay, I'm watching two. Fi I'm watching fire stream, uh, host streams go like this, and I see this open window. I wouldn't do that. Okay, I'm already watching this stuff, and I'm like, okay. Next thing you know, he's you know he won't do it. I'm like, fine, we won't do it. Next thing you know, big gust of water just comes right over us and just. <laughs> told you. That's that whole read the scene thing of like I'm watching, especially fire scenes. I got to watch all the other things going on around me. So. React appropriately in this case was just kind of like, can we go to the truck now? No, but reevaluate. Um, again, same thing. Reevaluate, plan, revise the plan. Sometimes you're gonna have to change it. Sometimes your therapy may not have worked as well as you did. You got to go to the next, you know, next level. Plan B, Plan C, whatever the case may be. And uh, review performance. This is actually going to become second nature after a while because you're going to set them back a lot of calls. You're going to be like, did I really do that right? Should I have done this right? Should I have done that right? You actually get kind of real unusually nitpicky over stupid things. A lot of people will be like, you know, and every paramedic usually does this. It's usually the ones who don't do that, usually the ones I kind of worry about because they're not sitting there thinking, huh? Really but yeah, especially with the, you know, yeah, I mean, I know there are some days you're like, yeah, I know you're kind of nausea vomiting, you just want to ride to the hospital, I can deal with that kind of thing. But it's like, if you're relatively sick and you're just kind of like, nah, you're not really care about the IVs you're doing, if you're even doing an IV, or you're just, you know, you're sitting there just kind of like doing that business, like you're not thinking about what's going on, you're not looking, you're not keeping yourself sharp on that. So, any questions? Um. Diagnosis on our uh, reports that, that you know when we're doing our reports and you're writing all this stuff down and you, when, do you think it's an MRI or you, is that in there? 